heading on to our interview with Jeff. Uh, he is from um, Alaska and is running his business, Ketchikan Evergreens, and I'm super excited to talk to you. This is probably one of the most popular sessions um, in this entire Digital Discovery Day. So, hi, Jeff. How are you? Hey. Good. I'm really good. That was fun to watch. Because why was it fun to watch? Because um, we're... Tell us about what's arriving maybe in days or weeks. Yeah, I think maybe Saturday or Sunday, depending on how things go. But yeah, we just put our greenery S on a barge in Seattle. And so it made the journey from Boston to Seattle um, smoothly. And it is now set to arrive in Ketchikan this weekend. Really exciting. And yeah. We're probably not going to put it down on the ground until um, after the Thanksgiving holiday. It's giving the timing of it all. But yeah, it's uh, coming to catch can soon, which is exciting. We'll be doubling our capacity and and that's exciting. Amazing. Um, all right. So why don't you start by just giving everyone an introduction to yourself, a little background, um, how many farms you currently have. And yeah, we'll just start there. Sure, okay. Well, um, so Ketchikan Evergreens is only, uh, you know, uh, as far as harvesting goes, we, we did our first harvest in July. Uh, and our community is um, in the uh, Southeast portion of Alaska. It's an archipelago or part of an archipelago of 700 islands. Um, there's just a handful of communities that exist there and in the Southeast region, maybe 75,000 people. Uh, Ketchikan is the considered the first city. So um, if you're traveling north along the Inside Passage, you'd arrive in our city first. And it's a hub community for a number of other smaller communities that exist on other islands. And, um, and, and so we have the hospital, we have the, the bigger airport with um, regular service to Seattle. And we have um, that direct barge link to Seattle. And so uh, despite that um, sort of relative luxury of, of things and stuff that Catch Can enjoys, we're still quite far away from, from the normal supply chain that exists um, for most of the rest of the continuous lower 48 uh, states. And so we um, have to be a little more resourceful. Um, there's definitely a, a culture of self-reliance and self-sufficiency that exists here. Um, and so we built our business um, with that in mind and, and knowing that food security was top of mind, not only for us, but for our community and, um, and that there was a market here for approaching food and food sustainability in a different way. Um, and currently what we have, it takes about three or four days for the bars to arrive. Um, after it leaves Seattle. So yeah, so we've been harvesting now. July was our first and, um, and things are going well and we're seeing our business grow and flourish and a lot of enthusiasm in the community. Um, and we can talk about all of that. I, um, my background actually was in tourism and tourism operations. Um, and my wife and I have, you know, I've been a guide in Alaska. Uh, we've run and opened up uh, remote lodges in a Kenai Fjord National, National Park. Um, and, uh, and then most recently I was doing international uh, and domestic adventure travel and outfitting, mostly whitewater rafting and sea kayaking based trips around the world. And, uh, and so the pandemic uh, was sort of a wake up call that, um, you know, things change and, and ideas about what you think your career is and should be will change, um, and and that's been an exciting journey for us to sort of reinvent ourselves. I know a lot of people around the world, and many probably watching this right now, have similar thoughts. Um, it seems to be that we certainly weren't alone in our our goal to change our life. Um, and Prey Farms was a great platform to do that, um, and and we're excited about what we're experiencing with it and the growth to come. So you didn't have any experience farming beforehand? 
yeah, nothing. Uh, I mean, we had a small raised bed garden in our home, um, and but hydroponics was new to us. And yeah, I can speak. I know that's probably it was certainly a question in my mind when I was approaching the system. I'd say no experience necessary, but you need to be curious. Um, you need to be a troubleshooter. Um, there are things that, um, you know, I'd say like you can run, Ray Farms does a great job of setting the table essentially for your success in, in diving into the system and getting started. And what I'm learning now is there's just even more to unlock, more to learn beyond that level that um, you want to dive into just to get started and get comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, and you certainly don't have to, but uh, it's one of the fun and exciting things about the system that that I enjoy as uh, as an operator is just learning how you can, you know, in a controlled uh, environment, uh, manipulate the the environment to your advantage and 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 give the plants more of what they need. And um, and and those are things that it seems like every week we have new ideas and new thoughts mm -hmm. so I it's not a it's dynamic in that regard right i love that you said that uh, a quality and a characteristic of a successful freight farmer would be that curiosity and maybe self-motivation so i'm curious we'll get more into kind of how things are going right now what you're growing and all that but let's take a step back and um, you know, if anyone has Googled where Ketchikan is, it is very far away. So let's um, talk about what the food landscape is like in Ketchikan and the opportunity that you were seeing um, and maybe what you were doing before you actually uh, doing to prepare before you actually pulled the trigger and purchased um, a farm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll start with your first question, the, the over kind of 10,000 foot view of food and supply chains in, in Ketchikan. Um, you know, uh, things generally here, uh, due to the, the remoteness of, of this place are more expensive than, than they would be elsewhere. Um, when it comes to agriculture and, and food production, uh, the, there's a lot of protein out there. There's a lot of opportunities to hunt and forage and fish, uh, not a lot of those actually find themselves uh, direct, direct to consumer and at market locally, unless you're out and getting it yourself or, or connected with people who can get it for you. Uh, and so then that leaves you with, and, and most residents here just using uh, grocery stores um, or even now in, the, in, in, as we've enjoyed, like everyone else, um, more connectivity with, with uh, you know, food suppliers, um, different food suppliers in your grocery store, the, those are starting to even be up here. Full Circle Farms is up here uh, delivering boxes of food. We have a wonderful um, freight forwarding produce supplier that's direct to consumer that's bringing in um, products from down south. But Catch Can is quite literally clinging to the rocky mountainside here. The entire commercial district is built on pilings over the water. And historically, that's how this area was developed. Um, and so most of the businesses in the downtown area actually have the tide rising and, and falling below them. Uh, and then the, a lot of the residential area is just clinging to the mountainside. And that exists up and down the island. There's about 15 miles of road north and south of the island that exists. That is the road system we have. Other than that, you're either flying in or taking a ferry off this island. There's no mainland direct bridge connection to anywhere else. And so um, because of that, there's really no arable land. There's no opportunities for soil farming on, on open flat land like you would find um, in most other uh, you know, states and communities. Uh, other parts of Southeast Alaska do have a little bit of, of that and there are uh, people doing wonderful permaculture and soil uh, based farming projects up here. It's still though a drop in the bucket in terms of 
meeting the demands uh, that, that these communities have for these products. Catch can's unique in that it just really doesn't have any of that. So controlled environment agriculture is really a new and promising technology for a community like us because we do have good access to hydropower and affordable power here in our community. Um, so we we um, have two grocery stores. We have a Safeway, your general sort of um, national chain brand. And we have a local grocery store. And we had a third grocery store that was probably the most beloved and historic uh, named Tatsudas uh, that uh, was just really a wonderful asset to the community. And it was destroyed with uh, tragically and thankfully overnight in a landslide that um, that completely totaled the building and the business no longer exists. Um, and so we've seen a reduction in our, even our food distribution capabilities in town. Um, and that with the pandemic, um, you know, laying bare other supply chain issues, we really dove into food security as the problem we wanted to solve as a business here in Ketchikan and to move away from tourism. And so um, in our preparation to come up here and before we, when I took the plunge, we did some market research and learned that lettuce and leafy greens were shipped up almost 2 million pounds to the Southeast region um, a year. And 11% of that was wasted on the barge or on the store shelves before it entered people's homes. And then more anecdotally, but talking to people, we, we learned that most people were feeling that the shelf life of the lettuce that they bought at the store was one to two days. Uh, and often you're buying items that are right on the edge of expiration. You're looking to see what is the least uh, rotten <laughs> of the crops. And we're in a place that sees barge service early, uh, earlier than other communities. Um, and so if we're struggling in that regard, it, it certainly paints the picture that some of these foods like leafy greens, lettuce and herbs are just not even accessible in other communities. So all that to be said that we saw a lot of opportunity to kind of bring an alternative uh, to the community and it, with control, controlled environment agriculture. And then the freight form platform, just from an entrepreneur's perspective, makes a lot of sense because of its all in one growing uh, design and, and having the ability to just bring one container up here and handle all of the, the, life, the entire life cycle of the plants we wanted to grow. Um, and so, we, we really appreciated that aspect, especially getting started. And, and then we went ahead and um, sold our home and bought the farm and uh, self-financed ourselves to this point. And it's only been in the second um, purchase of the Greenery S that we've gone ahead and, and approached um, some lenders and, and gotten financing for that. So what was the original business vision or business plan that you had put together? Because I know you do have tourists in the area, but you were looking to cater more towards the local residents. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, when you, when you just look at per capita consumption of lettuce and leafy greens in this town, we knew that that sort of estimated productive capacity of, of one greenery would maybe only meet like 2% of local demand, two or 3%. So and we knew that there just aren't alternatives. We aren't competing against soil farmers. So what was important to us and our values in, in developing this was, yes, it's nice to know that there's a lot of tourists in the summer and if and when we could cater to them, we could grow our business more and, and be successful. But our priority was to take care of the people that live here and, um, and are here doing wonderful things and, and, and um, growing their businesses and and making a living in a place that is challenging and if we could contribute to a little bit of their enjoyment and and take some pressure off this feeling that it's just um, hard to live up here because you don't get the finer things in life then then we felt that that was a winning concept so we're direct to consumer uh, for the majority of our business and we have a handful of restaurant partners that we work with that are kind of the local favorites. Um, and while they will serve tourists in the summer, that's certainly a place where we all like to hang out and enjoy 
a meal out as well. Um, and so, so yeah, we, we wanted that to be an emphasis of how we approach this, this business model and, and knew that we could be successful doing that, which is a little bit unique uh, in Alaska uh, because of the lack of competition from, from other um, producers. Yeah. I would argue that you have different, finer things accessible to you, like <laughs> what is available through the window uh, that you are sitting in front of. <laughs> it's yeah, it's beautiful. a nice day here. Um, yeah, don't worry. It's not dark all the time in Alaska, um, especially where we live on the southern end. But yeah, it, it's, um, it does rain here a lot, though. For, for those of you that are wondering, we get about 200 inches average a year in Seattle, which is known to be a rainy place, only gets 40. So, um, wow, that's a lot of rain. So we get a lot of rain. Yeah, we, we measure our rain at feet. Um, oh but it provides, you know, a climate that is, I mean, we have the, one of the biggest biomasses on the planet in the backyard, the Tongass forest and that rainforest ecosystem is, is just a huge amount of, um, oxygen production and um and just a you know it's it's not at risk of burning which i know is is some of the challenges that you know with forest management elsewhere and so we like we like the rain you know rain is is something that provides life and water and grows plants hydroponically and <laughs> um, and so we have good clean water here and and it's it's uh, something that we do enjoy yeah so we have lots to be grateful for and thankful for living in this place and and, uh, you know, you ask most people that thrive and live here and all the challenges that we face to make it work, you're worth it to be mm -hmm. in this place. Yeah. Great. Um, so when you decided to purchase the farm uh, and move forward with things, did you face any particular obstacles? Um, I know you didn't face financing obstacles since it was self-funded um, for the first one, but what about the placement of your farm, any zoning or or other things to be noted? Yeah, no, um, thankfully that was uh, fairly smooth. We do operate in the city. Uh, if we had chosen to operate in the borough, which is kind of our way of staying county, um, we would have probably, it would have been even easier, I imagine. Um, the We did have pull a permit to get um, power run to the container but structurally, um, containers are kind of a way of life up here. Everything comes in a container. So people are used to containers. You know, insurance companies know how to insure containers here. Alaska is a, a container friendly place. So it's not unusual for someone to ask to put a container down on a piece of property. So we're on commercial land. You know, that would have been a little more of an obstacle to try to put it on a residential or single family zoned area. We didn't have to worry about that. I'm sure it's still possible to do it um, that way. And so we just actually laid it down on some timbers for this first go around. Um, easy peasy, didn't, didn't require um, any engineering to, to get that done. And we're gonna put, uh, we, we've laid some concrete footers for this next layout. We're going to move the farm we have currently over five feet to the edge of the property. We have a 20 foot container that we're putting in the middle for some storage and, and additional dry space and, and something to develop in the future. And then, and then the next farm uh, will kind of make a, a U or a C shape. Um, and, and we're putting things in place with mine that will probably go up instead of out with any future investment or development in our space um, and stack stack what we want to do next above these farms, whether that's another shipping container or a greenhouse, um, you know, those are the ideas that, that we have. So, so you want to be planning ahead and thinking about not only, well, what makes sense for this one container that I bought now, but if I want to have more, what's going to make the, what kind of layouts are going to be ideal going forward. And I know many people also look into kind of trying to put an airlock on the front <laughs> of the container so you can mm -hmm. open the door. Uh, in Alaska, we call that an Arctic entry. Um, we don't have one and we actually face right into the wind direction opening the door. So there, there will be some exciting winter moments in store for us, I'm sure. And that'll light the fire for us to try to probably redesign that um, mm -hmm. with something comfortable to help us take our coats and boots off before we jump in there. <laughs> for sure. 
Um, all right. So what did, so you got the farm, how quickly were you able to plant seeds um, and, and kind of get up and running? And, and what did you decide to plant right off the bat? Yeah. Um, so we received the farm by the time we kind of took possession, it was early May of 2021. Uh, and I'd say we probably seeded by, I think I have a idea of like third week of May. So a couple of weeks to get it set and settled and get the waking strips installed and sensors up and running and just kind of get everything dialed in. And then, you know, you can kind of just start in the seedling area and you have a few weeks beyond that to get the main cultivation area ready for transplanting. So, so that, that buys you a little bit of time before you, it's not like you have to have everything completely set before you can just jump in with seeds. And we were trying to launch in the summer. And so we were, it was important to us to try to have some, take advantage of some of the local farmers markets as sort of a nice soft entrance into, into people's um, homes here. Great. Uh, and you had yeah, another question. Yeah. What did you decide to grow right off the bat? Oh, uh, lettuces. Uh, and we chose Salanova lettuces to begin with um, for a couple of reasons, but um, we also were probably overly experimental with greens, leafy greens to begin with, um, which are just wonderful and we still grow a lot of them, um, but knowing the right ones to grow and the way they grow is, is a little more, uh, it takes a little bit more experience and hands-on with, with them and lettuce, you know, you can just assume that it's gonna grow sort of symmetrically in all directions out. Salanovas because uh, we felt like entering into the market here, most, you know, of the lettuce that gets shipped up here, you have sort of the baby leaf lettuce that comes in a clamshell uh, or you have some head lettuce. Well, the head lettuce really does not survive the journey well. And, and it, it, is, it is something that a lot of people just don't even mess around with. And so we wanted to create a product that was more comparable to what most people were buying, which is the kind of clamshell of, of baby leaf greens, mixed greens, um, spring mix. And, and so Salanovas lend well to that because of the way they grow. They don't produce huge leaves. They produce many, many small leaves, baby leaves. It's like a whole head of baby leaves. They're very beautiful. They're more expensive as a seed, but we found that they're, they're worth it for that ability to have sort of even growth of all the of the leaves and um, they're easy to then um, remove from the root as we harvest and um, and then add uh, into a, a blended bag and sell. And how is the response from your your customers? Oh, it's it's funny. I mean, we get um, we have some super fans for sure. And we are um, noticing that uh, once people are eating our greens, uh, they are pretty much wholly unable to go back to the store and eat lettuce from, from the grocery store. Um, and that's caused some funny and desperate emails or phone calls if they miss an order uh just hoping that we have extras and can fulfill and we have people sometimes waiting for us outside the door with their hands out saying <laughs> you know please i'm so excited you're here um and so really you know the one of the joys of of being in this business is that reaction that people are having to you know getting something that is just one of the best things they've ever had in terms of food, um, which, uh, you know, which we're really proud of. And um, yeah, I think, you know, the market right now is as we put our product up for sale weekly, um, we put it up at 2 p.m. on Thursdays, um, probably within the first three minutes of doing that, we have about 18, 19 orders out the door and we sell out in about six hours. And this is for a delivery that will come the following Wednesday. Um, so we, we basically guess on how much our harvest will be and then we put it out there. Um, it sells out quickly and then we take a wait list. And then on Tuesday, when we know what we've actually harvested we contact our waitlist 
we open up a sale for them privately and then we sell out. So we have no problem selling, which is wonderful. And yeah, our, our, uh, the community is very excited and they're extremely excited about another farm coming. Um, and so, uh, we, we see nothing but positive things coming for this business model. And I think others will join us and, um, and there's room for, you know, more of this type of, of uh, agriculture up here. And so if we help inspire that change in the community at large, it will also be something, a source of pride for us. And um, yeah. For sure. Uh, and that's just great to hear. It's, it's very common uh, that people get a bit addicted to the, the produce growing out of out of the farm. So let's let's dive in a little bit more to the business logistics side of things because sometimes in addition to having no farming experience, some people have no experience maybe building websites or an e-commerce store. So um, talk to us about things like how you got your website up and running and how do you who or how are you managing this store? Yeah. Um, given the scope of everything we had to do to, to get our, our, our business started. We kind of outsourced the building of the website and our e-commerce platform to a company that is based out of Seattle that specializes in farm to consumer uh, direct sales uh, in e-commerce. And it is called Barn to Door. Uh, I know a handful of other freight farmers that use it, but they certainly aren't the only way that you can sell your product directly. Um, they, um, and the, and part of their sort of, uh, introduction to their platform is they'll build your website on Squarespace for you. Um, and so, yeah, we, we didn't have too much trouble building something simple with them and, and, um, getting started with the world of e-commerce with them has been, uh, has been simple. And uh, we may at some point maybe develop our own website and, and that would be fine. And, and you know, we just redirect our URL to, to that website just so that we have some more capabilities, more features, more control. Um, so that's one of the things, I guess one of the downsides of using them is you have some limited access and control to that website that they built for you. Um, and so all, all things will come when we have time. Right now we're just kind of focused on production. So uh, it's nice to, to not have to worry about some of these these other elements, and really, I think one of the best systems we use to to handle is, like, yeah, of course, you can grow things and you can sell them on an e-commerce platform quite simply. But how do you distribute them? Um, and we decided not to be in grocery stores initially, and and not for any. I mean, we want to support grocery stores here; they they are vital link to to life here in Alaska but because a lot of the costs of operating here in Alaska in particular and even just with the new business were unknown to us we wanted to have complete control from seed all the way to people's doorstep and um and felt we had the time and and ability to do that and one of the ways that we do that is so we do we do direct delivery up and down the island once a week it takes me I, I think I do about 12 deliveries an hour at this point um last night i did 60 deliveries and so it, it takes an evening to do it um but we use a routing software that will optimize the route and it sends our customers notifications it live tracks me on my delivery so they know where i am and they get a notification when they're the next delivery as also one that confirms i delivered all these things when you're delivering a fresh food product in a you know, less than ideal climate like Alaska are important and, um, and a little bit fancy and, and people love it. So uh, it is great because it does get a lot of them out on their doorstep to meet me and greet me and say hi. So we have a lot of direct relationships that we're building with our customers, which is, you know, if you get into this business, that's, if, if you like people um, and you grow food for them, they uh, really appreciate it and they want to support you and be friendly. And sometimes if you're just um, handing it off to a restaurant or a grocery store, you're not gonna get that face-to-face -face connection. And you know, we're a small isolated community and, and all we have are 
are each other and and it's kind of like a little city state here so being able to connect with our customers in that way has been really really wonderful and and these systems allow us to do that and do it without a lot of stress or headache i didn't know that about the software that you're using that's i'm gonna pass that along to the team so we can recommend it as well for our direct-to-consumer farmers yeah there's uh, a number of them out there uh, we use one called optimo route okay their customer service has been excellent we found it was the most affordable for the features we wanted you know some of these things are designed for huge operations so you know supply chain shipping mm -hmm. and delivery in a big city um so you know you and, and are priced accordingly um and so i think i pay 39 dollars a month for that service and it's worth it you know i don't there's no way i could load up 60 addresses here <laughs> And, and accomplish, you know, 60 deliveries in four hours. Um, this wouldn't be possible. So it, it's important. If you're going to get into delivery, I would highly recommend you go down that path. Definitely. That's great. Um, so could you talk to us and, you know, you do direct to consumer. You also sell to a couple restaurants. Could you tell us how you determined your pricing for your crops? Yeah. Um, tough because you're off you're honestly rolling out a product before your full cost of goods is even realized on some level and what you're so it's you know you, like any business plan you're going on projections and hoping that you're you're accurate and then pricing accordingly um and then you also want to be competitive uh with you, you know what, whatever it is your competition is and so we kind of really guided ourselves in that way we knew that we certainly wanted to be accessible to everybody and, and not something that was only for, for folks that, you know, had a higher income and could afford it. Um, and, and at the same time we knew we needed to cover our basis. So we found that in the store, people are already paying a dollar an ounce for a, a uh, tub of, of mixed leaf baby greens um, and, and they're honestly not that high quality um, and they're and, and like I said they're kind of right at the edge of their expiration in many cases and so we knew the market was certainly ready to absorb that cost a, as a price and then we just um, said well let's come in just a bit higher than that and so we it, it, I think it works out to be a dollar seven an ounce um, for our lettuce product and then we do mix some of our specialty greens in with our lettuce and that one works out to be about a dollar 25 an ounce um, because those leafy greens are going to be you know they have more nutritional value in some cases they're um they're interesting and unique uh, in terms of even having access to them here and they're a little bit harder to quantify sometimes uh, what it's costing you to grow them and their yields can be a little more variable, uh, particularly depending on the plant. So, so we need, we felt like we needed to charge a little bit more for that, but, but just straight kind of apples to apples were seven cents an ounce more than, than at the store. And that's for a home delivered product uh, that is harvested the day before you receive it. So you're getting it less than 24 hours. So our value proposition is kind of off the charts in comparison, and maybe we're undervaluing our product, but it's important to us that people have access to this uh, food. And we felt that we could be competitive and, and meet the needs of our business and our goals and uh, with that. And, and I think that's one of the nice things about what we're doing is the people who are buying wholesale lettuce and shipping it up here have some pretty extreme cost to deal with themselves um, that, and, and are selling, um, you know, and are, uh, you know, selling a, a product that is expensive uh, in general. And I, you know, but what is funny is I honestly look at what lettuce costs uh, in tubs down in the lower 48 and it seems like it's also almost a dollar an ounce. So um, I don't know if it seems like Ketchikan the lettuce here isn't moving with the price of milk. It's gonna stay stable. I don't know. They just have that figured out somehow. Um, so, yeah. Great. That was that was thorough. Thank you. 
Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to gauge whether I keep going with my questions or jump to audience questions because we're getting a lot. Um, let's. I mean, I think where I'll stop with my question is, how are you feeling about this lifestyle change that you and Jess and Porter uh, uh, took 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 under? Like, how how is it going? How are you feeling? Do you feel like it's met your expectations um yeah i'll just let you take it where you may yeah it's a good question and i don't know how like my experience is of course going to be so different from anyone else's um and but so starting a business is scary that will uh i'll be honest about that and and we're taking big risks with our finances and our um and, and uh, you know, just a, what we used to have as a, a very comfortable salary and income and and kind of an easygoing lifestyle. But my work was challenging. It was, we were, I was managing uh, hundreds of people and, and division managers that were placed in various parts of the world, um, running adventure travel trips, which can be dynamic and, and challenging. Um, because, uh, and unpredictable, uh, and it was a lot of fun, but I was certainly burning out, I think on that and the pandemic really added extra challenges to that as well as just kind of laid bare the vulnerability of the industry. And so there's a sense of comfort and satisfaction, I guess, that we now have in having some direct control over our, our income and our fortune and our, on our uh, financial future and a lot of upside and growth um, and a lot of pride in what we do. Uh, my wife now, uh, you know, she had stayed at home with our five-year-old Porter. Uh, and so Jess and I, she's a co-owner. Um, she's not here right now. She's actually doing some marketing and meeting with our restaurant partner today. Um, and she uh, had been staying at home with Porter. So now she's jumping into this business. Um, so big lifestyle change for her uh, and you know, the work is, uh, you know, you're, you're in a shipping container, you are um, doing the work of food production, and um, it's not uh, always glamorous, you know, you have to get in there and roll up your sleeves, and you're pulling down panels and plucking heads of lettuce off and, and storing them and refrigerating them and making sure you're doing, you know, keeping a food safe environment, you're, there's a lot to track, a lot to, to keep on your mind. And, and so stress is certainly part of, part of our entrepreneurship. And so I wouldn't say it's any different than anyone else starting any other business. Um, but, um, you know, what we get outside of, um, or, or for that effort and stress and, and feelings of, um, you know, any adversity that we might face in our business is just a lot of satisfaction of, of having our own business and, and doing what we want to do and be able to have our own schedule and answer to no one and but ourselves and, and our customers, right? They, they're the people that we are uh, now in charge of taking care of and, and growing with. And, and so that's, that's really meaningful. And, and I think that trumps everything. Like we are happy we made the decision Ketchikan is where my wife grew up. This is home. We have family here. We wanted to be here again. Uh, and, and, and doing this has allowed us to realize those goals. Um, so it really depends on what your goals are. Um, but, uh, you know, while Freight Farms does a good job of making growing food easy, uh, easier than maybe um, other systems or, uh, or, or your traditional farm, agriculture is a challenging business. And it's, um, again, I go back to, you should be a troubleshooter. You should love um, what you're doing uh, because it's making a positive impact on your community and, um, and be prepared to learn a lot in the process. And, and you know, you'll, you'll find hopefully like I did that a lot of personal satisfaction in doing that. That was great perspective. Thank you. Um, 
you may have touched upon this a little bit, obviously, because of the quality of the produce and the shelf life, but did you have to overcome any challenges to get consumers to accept this new way of growing that maybe they weren't used to? Um, well, hydroponics, funnily enough, has been, you know, and many people are doing small scale hydroponic projects here. So it wasn't a completely new concept to the community. Um, just nothing on a commercial scale. So some people are either growing basil hydroponically in their home or, you know, a few heads of lettuce, the pioneer home, which is a much beloved um, senior living residence uh, on the island had introduced hydroponics into their um, community and into their kitchen. And so they grow some of their own food. So um, people of course want to know uh, what you're using um, and have some basic questions of, about it, but we certainly haven't had, I would say no hurdles really getting people to try our product. And once they try it, you know, it's, it's uh, clear right from the start that this is just, there's much more flavor. And I think the body just craves nutrition and, you know, we have little, sometimes we kind of feel like we're like dealing in vitamins and dealing in nutrition, the way that people are so, excited and happy to be eating this food and i think it is because you know we, we live a little bit more of a nutrient deficient life up here sometimes the lack of sun and and the lack of good um agricultural products and so yeah i think we've kind of hit a home run there in terms of what people um are comfortable accepting a lot of people were asking and we'll do rapid fire because we're definitely behind okay. how much time are you spending growing per week in the farm we'll start with that one but i guess i'll summarize like farm operations we run from really we're in the farm monday through wednesday like doing the things that have to be done in terms of like production distribution processing um can you still hear me i can still hear you okay because this i'm getting a call back again i'm gonna try not to blow this um can you still see me no but it's, okay. I mean, it's okay if you don't want to touch anything. Uh, all right. Anyway, the, uh, I did it. The, uh, so my wife and I will work together. I think we're in the farm maybe like for five hours on Monday together. So 10 man hours and then another five hours the next day, Tuesday. Um, you know, I, I'd say like we're putting in between the two of us like 30 hours to, and, and th that's by ch a little bit by the way that we design because processing the lettuce and bagging it takes longer. Um, if we were selling whole head product just to restaurants, wow, we would be saving a lot of time. Um, it would be much faster. And then, you know, then there's kind of the, the maintenance side of things that we do on Thursday and Friday, but we, we have our weekends that may change when we get the S um, for a little bit, but we still think we can dial it in and kind of, and we're our only employees. So like, so it's just the two of us. Um, and yeah, it's great. I mean, Thursday today, I'm talking to you, farm's doing its thing. Um, in, in terms of like our planting or transplanting, our harvesting, transplanting, seeding, we do that all on Monday. So we get that cycle through. Tuesday is more of like cutting greens off the wall and processing. Wednesday is bagging and delivery. So there it is. Perfect. That leads me to my other question, how you package your produce, because lots of people are asking about packaging. And obviously, you likely package differently for your direct-to-consumer in your restaurant. Yeah. In, uh, so for restaurants, we will use a biodegradable, um, you know, 13-gallon bag that we can load up greens in. Um, if we're going to do whole head product, though, we'll put it, we have some reusable plastic totes and we like to, we can fit about 12 or so heads in each tote and, and then we hand that off and cycle them back. So we try to not use any um, single use plastic for the restaurant delivery. It seems like single use plastic kind of still has to be part of the game for your direct consumer model at least if you're going to do like a cut leaf product like we are because um the biodegradable stuff breathes too much and and it just loses the lettuce loses its moisture and firmness um 
quite quickly in those types of bags. Um, and so we use a probably like a 1.5 mil uh, gusseted, maybe three inch gusset on the bottom, 15 inches tall, six inches wide plastic bag. Uh, and then we print out stickers. We use the Avery shipping labels. We print out a sticker on our printer six at a time, slap that on there and zip tie the top and on to the next one. And you kind of zip tie it with a lot of air inside so that the produce kind of stays protected, don't you? Yeah, that's, that's a good idea for sure. And, um, you know, it'll start to lose air eventually, but the, yeah, the more you can kind of balloon the bag up so that the lettuce uh, doesn't get smushed. That's, just, that's always going to be better. Yes. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jeff. Everyone is super grateful for your perspective and for your time today. We really yeah. appreciate it. Um, Amy is going to put in the chat your Instagram and your website for people who can follow along on your journey, okay. especially as they're as you're waiting for your S to arrive, because I'm sure they will be very curious to see how that goes. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. And just remember, I was all of you about a year ago at this time looking in, so um, it can be done yeah. and good luck. And, uh, and thanks for uh, letting me tell you about what we got going on up here. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye.